our next panel is going to be moderated by my good friend John Powers, who is the co-founder and board member of the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado. Okay. And we're going to talk about closing the gap to a clean energy transition and adaptation. I want to thank Chip, Sally, the team for putting on another wonderful R Day. Thank you, Janice, for the introduction. I'm John Powers, co-founder of the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado with my 30-year colleague, Janice Six. And I'm here today to tell you about the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado and introduce the topic. Uh, the Alliance was founded in 2004. Its basic reason is to uh, find solutions through partnership. We have a building, which is our cornerstone project in downtown Denver called the Alliance Center. Uh, since 2004, we've earned four LEED certifications and Energy Star Leader. Why have we done that? We've done that to draw attention to the collaboration that's going on inside the building. We also use the collaboration inside the building to draw attention to green design and green technologies, which is why we got the four LEED certifications. So today we're going to tell you about our current project, which is we've been measuring the energy consumption throughout the building with very specific circuits to see what the consumption is using alternating current. And as you know, with solar panels and the dropping cost of batteries, we're now doing a test to see how much energy we can save by converting portions of the building to direct current using batteries. Our long-term goal will be to convert the whole building, but we're starting with this test case. Today, you're going to hear from key team members of the DC project, Sandy Vanderstoop with PVI Construction and Maintenance Company, who is the project manager, Catherine Diam with Extragy, and Derek Calvern with Lumen Cash. So I'm going to turn this over now to our project manager, Sandy Vanderstoop. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, thanks, John. Every, everybody should have a John Powers in their life, a, a visionary who makes sure that what is possible to do in this world can really happen. And so uh, what we're here to do, I just want to correct the title. We are, we are here to talk about not market adaption, we're here to talk about market adoption in terms of clean energy. And what we want to be able to, to show you is uh, a, a slide that looks like this, so that as as borrowing heavily from Tony Seba. I want you to take a quick look at an S-curve because what we have right now is early adoption uh, uh, that is very expensive and reasonably slow. And what we have in front of us and what I hear today is the convergence of all the people working together to fill in the chasm. The chasm is being filled in with bus, you just heard Ryan talking about uh, the conversion of the of, uh, transit buses. Catherine, Catherine is, from Exergy is going to talk, talk to us about what it is going to take to have rural electrification at, at, at a clean energy level, not only in America, but throughout the world. Derek Coburn uh, flew in from China in order to be here today to share with you what Lumen Cash and the Clean Energy Research Center is doing in China in a US-China combination uh, uh, that is working together to make clean energy possible throughout the world at a cost that is, in fact, well below grid parity. Clean energy is now the, the, the alternative of choice in terms of not only clean energy, but in terms of cost. And so having reached that, we are going to fill in that chasm with two talks. There, you will recognize them perhaps as mini TED Talks. That's what they're described as. So they're going to go back to back in terms of these talks. And then we're going to open it up for questions. And if any of you have ever heard John Powers give his, make sure that you leave here with an action plan, he's going to wind it up today. So thank you all very much. Catherine, please. <laughs> Okay, so crossing this chasm to a clean energy future is going to take a lot of different strategies and innovative thinking, and we've already heard a lot of that today. Um, I want to talk about one of those strategies, which is beneficial electrification, and how um, we can actually look to rural America to lead the charge. 
So this story starts with renewables, and I, I know you all know that renewables are um, growing in penetration, and you know, we're setting all kinds of records. Um, there are two, uh, two drivers that are important for this conversation. Um, one is declining costs of renewables. Um, renewables, uh, utilities, solar, and wind are cost competitive with fossil fuel generation now. And this is being appreciated across the country, including in rural America. Um, one example that I really like comes out of Aztec, New Mexico. And if you're not familiar with Northwest New Mexico, um, they have a history of coal plants and gas uh, generation. There's gas wells everywhere. But the city of Aztec just left their contract with PNM, uh, the utility provider in New Mexico, um, because their costs were going up. They found that if they signed with an electricity provider that really focused in procuring and investing in renewables, they could lower their prices. And as part of their deal, they also got a one megawatt um, solar farm. So we have solar going up in the middle of Gasland. Um, the second trend is we have a lot of goals. Um, at the state level, there are 20 states that, have, that already have uh, carbon emissions targets on the books. And there are 37 states that either have renewable portfolio standards or renewable penetration targets. Um, and then in the past few weeks, we've heard about cities and states and businesses affirming or reaffirming their commitment to the Paris Agreement. So we have a lot of really great momentum going, but we have a long ways to go. Um, our electric, electric supply today, only about 15% comes from new re renewables on the grid. And this is counting solar, wind, and hydro. We want to move the needle up to 100%. But it's not so simple as just adding more renewables to the grid. We have this challenge of integrating renewables um, because they often generate electricity when we don't actually need it. Um, and so we're actually running into situations uh, like in California and Hawaii this spring, areas with high penetration of renewables, they're actually having, having to dump some of that um, generation during the day because it's more than the current demand. Um, so we need a flexible grid, and I'm gonna come back to that, um, but we need loads that can take up this renewable generation when it's occurring. And even as we work to green the grid, that's not enough because fossil fuel use is pervasive, as we've heard earlier today, um, both in our transportation, our mobility, and also in the equipment in our buildings, um, like space heating and water heating. So if we just look at an example today, um, if we take the typical home in the US and add one passenger car, only 10% of that home's energy use comes from renewable electricity. And if we were to completely green the grid, all renewables, we could move the needle up to 55% of that home's electricity um, is renewable, its energy use is renewable. Um, but that leaves 45% of that home's energy use coming from fossil fuels burned in that car and in the appliances on site. So we need to electrify those loads. We are not going to get to a, a clean energy, low carbon future if we don't address these loads. But the key is to do it in a strategic and beneficial way. So what do I mean by beneficial? Um, the regulatory assistance program has actually outlined three, um, three areas that need to benefit. Um, and so this is their work. Um, first, the environment needs to benefit. Obviously, we need a net reduction in emissions from any sort of electrification. Um, second, there needs to be a benefit to the consumer. Um, you know, no one's, we're not going to be able to cross that chasm unless there's a cost benefit. And finally, there's a benefit to the grid. Most of the loads that we're talking about electrifying are these flexible loads, these loads that can be charged or used when renewable generation is occurring. 
Um, and the utility can control these loads and offer rates to encourage use of these loads during times of um, renewables. Now, I want to mention the utilities. They're going to play a key and central role in any sort of electrification. Um, because not only are they integrating these renewables onto the grid, they're, they're investing in renewables, but they're also a touch point to the consumer. Um, they can offer incentives for consumers to electrify their um, appliances and vehicles by offering um, you know, reductions in first costs. They also offer special rate structures to encourage use of those loads um, when they need to be used um, in times of um, low demand on the grid. And so utilities in areas that have um, you know, pretty aggressive goals around um, climate targets are going to need to think about beneficial electrification um, now rather than later. But we're also looking at rural America as um, an area that um, can really help drive this. So um, most of rural America is served by electric co-ops. And if you're not familiar with the electric co-op model, it's pretty similar to any other co-op. Um, if you buy electricity from the co-op, you're a member. Um, and the co-op is run by a board that's elected by the members. So this means that the members can really influence what the co-op is doing. The board has to be responsive to the, the members' wants and needs. Um, the co-ops, most co-ops are not regulated, um, so they can do some kind of innovative or, or a little bit off the wall um, programs um, and move fairly quickly. Um, and finally, they have a tradition of electrifying rural America. Um, in the 30s, they built transmission lines to get to farms and um, far-flung communities. They also helped people buy um, clothes washers and electric clothes washers and uh, ovens um, and stop using wood-fired ones. Um, so because of member pressure and, and also because of declining costs, uh, co-ops are leading in community solar projects. This map shows the co-ops across the nation that have either existing or planned uh, community solar projects. Um, and I think key here is that you know, the members are demanding it. They want clean energy that's controlled locally. And oh yeah, there's a cost benefit too. So co-ops are leading here. They can lead in beneficial electrification as well. I'm gonna show you a few examples of what they're already doing. Uh, the first comes out of Western Farmers Co-op in uh, Oklahoma. They recently ran a program uh, where they exchanged uh, members' propane or natural gas-fired furnaces for an electric ground source heat pump, which is much more efficient. Um, not only did we see a reduction in emissions, but the consumers saved a lot of money, 22 percent savings and heating costs for those that had uh, natural gas furnace originally, and a whopping 75% for those who are on propane. Um, Great River Energy is a really interesting co-op out of uh, Minnesota, and they're doing a lot of good things around electrification and energy efficiency. Um, one of their programs, uh, members are buying shares of community solar projects um, and in turn, they get a highly reduced uh, rate on an electric water heater. So the members are buying clean energy, they're, getting, um, they're saving on their water heating bill, and the utility, the co-op, is getting essentially a battery. They're getting a flexible load that they can charge up when demand is low. Um, and then they're, they're running another program um, around electric vehicles. They give an incentive for the EV charging station, and then they offer a special reduced rate for charging at night um, and wind ener energy credits. So essentially, these members are um, powering their electric vehicles with nighttime wind, um, wind energy. 
And so as we looked across this chasm to a, a clean, low carbon uh, energy future, and there's a lot of, we really need to work on the grid and decarbonize that. But we also need to pay attention to our transportation and, and the equipment in our buildings if we truly want to get to a clean energy future. And we can look to rural America and the electric co-ops uh, that serve them for leadership here. And if you're a member of a co-op, you know, you can go to your board and, and demand this. And if you're not a member, you can, you can help grassroots efforts that'll escalate this um, up to the boards of these co-ops. Um, so, so thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Catherine. My name is Derek. Um, and I, as I look out into the room here, um, I just see a really great group of enablers, and that's really important. And so hopefully, um, because of the excellent technical summary that Catherine just did about how we get energy into buildings, I can talk a little bit about what we're doing, about making all buildings smart from the start. So <clears throat> as you've heard, I've, uh, I'm flown in here from China, so I'm a little tired. Uh, <clears throat> but I had the opportunity over Chinese New Year to spend uh, some time out in rural China with uh, a friend of a family. And what I want to point out here is right there. Do you see that? Can you see it on the screen? That's the light bulb. <laughs> this is real. This is rural electrification in many parts of the world. But what really cracks me up is this part. They've got smart home automation. That's a wind-up timer. They take that timer and very simple, right? It works. It works. These things have to work. And so why is it that we have so much trouble in our smart cities, right? Well, this. This is part of the reason. This massive Internet of Things landscape and all these amazing technologies, and it's just, it's a mess, right? So builders who build these smart cities and buildings that we all live in, that's what they say. I, I don't want to deal with it. It's not reliable. If it's not reliable, it's my ass on the line. Not going to happen. So. What drives these builders' decisions? You know, maybe it's fame, maybe it's generosity, greed sometimes, but fear, right? So many times it's fear. So, and they have a lot to fear, actually. There's a lot of technology that's changing constantly. Just look at the power coming into the buildings, right? It used to be easy. You'd pick one of two standards in the world, AC 50 hertz or 60 hertz, but now you've got all these devices that are DC and the same thing is happening on the demand side, right? So we don't just have a plug-in device anymore. I shouldn't say that, we do. We have a USB jack, which is how almost all of us charge and power most of our devices. So this conversion has to take place constantly. And many of you probably have desks that look like this. You hide it underneath, but really, in every single device that we use nowadays, we're doing this conversion. Every single LED light bulb, first thing it has to do is convert from the AC to DC. Then the LED does constant current into the LED array. Those things age at different rates. So when an LED bulb pops, you're throwing away a perfectly good LED array usually. Then you have you know, this mass of green bulbs, and so people say, well, let's make it smart and sensors and things. And so they add all this wireless to it well, did you know that most of the wireless smart bulbs actually draw about a half a watt when they're off? Just maintaining that communications. So if you've got 10 LED light bulbs in a space, it's the same as having one LED light bulb running the whole time. So, and then there's batteries, and so now you've got e-waste and battery technology. So wireless is really a very weak foundation, unfortunately. It's the only thing we can do to get communications easily to the existing three billion light sockets that are out there but it's really not good for new construction. And if you think about our cars, could you imagine if car builders said, well, you know what, here's your car, but you have to add power windows, power door locks, ABS, everything else, right? That's exactly what happens when you buy a home because the builder's like, you put the technology in, I don't want to do that. But we do know that having this kind of integration level gives us a systems level savings that's far beyond what an individual device can do. You get much better savings when you're able to have these devices talking to each other. So that's where energy management comes in. And energy management really can't be done in that little tiny process or inside of each light bulb. It has to be done at the building level. So what's common to all devices these days? What's our least common denominator? DC power. 
communications, and energy management. And technology changes constantly, so that builders are faced with this rapid obsolescence. But what if every single car, or every single building, could be just like a car? It has that control network built into it. So, what does Cisco say? Boom, power over Ethernet. It's going to solve the problem, right? Power over Ethernet is one technology. There's already five versions of it that are out, and there's going to be another version next year. So we know technology changes like crazy. So how do we start to solve this? I love this uh, ad. This is an ad by IBM, and it's this connector device sitting on the desk, and the guy says, what is it? It's a universal adapter. It adapts anything to anything. And the guy's like, wow, that's great. How do I connect my home system to it? He goes, well, you'll need an adapter. <laughs> So, so the reality is we're always going to need an adapter. There will be no one perfect pill to solve everything. So being as we have to already kind of have a very modular system um, and we need to have wires to these devices. I don't want to cook inside of a big wireless mess. Um, if you can imagine the way the wireless networks work today, um, when all of us are talking in a small room and we start talking louder and louder to each other, and then it gets so bad, so wireless technology said, well, no problem. All you do is you tell you, you tell you, and you tell you, because I'm trying to get the message to you. It's kind of crazy. And there's billions of devices now that are going to be online. So for built in, the built environment, let's stick with wired. It works perfectly. We've been doing structured wiring for years. Structured wiring is how we get to our access points to make wireless more robust and a little bit more reliable. So what we did is we said, well, let's just combine this DC power and the data into a new platform inside of buildings. It connects to everything. It powers all the low voltage devices. They're already DC, so we've got an efficiency gain right there. We've got a controller gain. Plus, it adapts to any new power input technology. It scales beautifully throughout all kinds of applications. It makes all the applications work better, in fact. So all these kind of smart home technologies are easier to achieve, more reliable, and that's really what we want. So for a builder looking at this, builder looks at those blue application cards and goes, this is great. I can put in a low cost LED light chip or driver connecting to the LED lights. But when the, is that right? when the, <laughs> when the uh, new occupant hops in, they pop in a Li-Fi card. And instantly that light now is able to communicate way faster than wireless. So instant new technology, right? Compatibility is maintained by the backplane. We do the same thing on the energy input side because energy input's changing. So a builder can put in an AC infrastructure today. Two years from now, they can put the solar panels on the roof and run through, because the DC infrastructure has already been installed, just wires. And the users in each one of the apartment units, for example, can snap in a card and they instantly get reliable, uh, robust, resilient energy. So, and we can power mid devices. That's the first question people ask. What about my air conditioner? So, I was given a great opportunity to work in China as a, a joint venture between the Department of Energy and the Ministry of Urban Housing and Development in China. Little tiny Lumen Cash is now the industrial co lead for this. So, the technology is really being adopted. They found and they think that this can help solve their 20% energy reduction in all buildings in China by 2020. And you saw that one slide that showed the smart building. It's incredible. So, met some great friends along the way. My personal favorite today is the selfie with uh, Secretary Perry. I just, <coughs> I just love that one. Um, we've got great partners on board to join us because they all see this natural trajectory of what's going on. We've got some government grant programs, both in China and the U.S., that are happening to help all the little pieces of this come along. Some private partnership, um, private-public partnerships that are happening in Hawaii, for example. A million dollars of this product has been sold that's a prototype to really show that this is a product that actually solves a big problem. And it was just made for lighting. That was kind of the first thing we did. But we realized we had to make this bigger. Remember Eisenhower said, if you have a big problem and you want to solve it, you have to expand it. Right? Well, that's true. We all have to do that. We have to get more pieces included. So in my case, LumenCache is this little thread that sits underneath all the smart city applications, making them easier. So builders have a choice. They can install the old technology and then adapt to the new. Like when we plug in our computer adapters, we're adapting to the new technology. Or we can install new technology and just adapt backwards to the old. It's the same thing. It's a little plug-in box that just adapts backwards. So, Essentially, what we did is we came up with a transition strategy that kind of helps the world just come along easily, right? Get rid of that fear factor. And we're not boiling the ocean. 
because other people have solved the solar panels, they've solved the batteries, the grid edge activities. We just handle the stuff inside the building where all the loads are inside. Got a great following. And what was really important is we felt like we had to make energy saving a convenience, or excuse me, energy savings becomes a byproduct of that because really what drives our decisions? Passion, right? All of us are here and all of us are gonna go back and talk to our friends and tell them about what we learned at, at ARE Day. And we're just gonna say, this is cool, this is here. I saw demonstrations of it. I saw people talking about case study after case study, et cetera. And I love this um, TED talk that was by Derek Sivers and it's called How to Start a Movement. And there's a guy, a nut, he is dancing at this public concert. If you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. And what Derek is talking about is how leadership is achieved. Leadership is actually achieved by the first follower. So the first follower is who transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> so I'm the lone nut in this weird electrification thing. John is a lone nut in a much bigger uh, picture. And so, but all of us really need you guys. You have to be the first followers. You're the strongest ones actually. We're up there doing our thing because we're crazy. But the same people is who everybody else follows. So I uh, really appreciate your time and I hope you've enjoyed this. Don't you love it when you say to somebody, look, um, you have, a, you have 10 minutes to make a presentation and they are spot on on time, <laughs> just spot on. Thank you very much. Great, great information. We, we now have time for some significant Q&A. So um, I know there are questions that have been raised, so let's, let's hear from you all. Over here. Anybody ready to be queued up over here? Okay, great. Oh. Many of us work or in or uh, operate businesses out of buildings that we don't own. A landlord owns them. They tend to be uh, slow and unwilling to make investments for a tenant that might only be there for five or ten years. Do you have any thoughts, suggestions, or ideas how tenants in buildings can move this process forward as well? Mm. That's, that's a great point. Um, like everything, follow the money. Somewhere, somewhere there is an economic impact for that decision. Um, so it could be that your, you know, your rent is set up and your, uh, your lease is designed in such a way that it really doesn't incentivize any kind of savings. Um, renegotiate it. You know, get out there and do what you can because ultimately um, if you say to the landlord, hey, look, if we put this in, we'll split the difference with you. I don't know. Find some way to help promote these kinds of things. Um, if you have a new technology that you're presenting th to them, it could very well be that they'll be able to use it for other tenants and, you know, give them some value. I'd also say that utilities can play a role in this. Um, they can incentivize um, either new construction um, with, you know, smart technologies or uh, retrofits. Um, mm. So sometimes the utilities can lead that as well. And, and if I can add another thing, I, I worked for many years with ESCOs, energy service companies. And of course, uh, you know what an energy service company is, right? It's, it's um, one engineer and two attorneys, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, you, you can definitely leverage them also. Um, uh, rationality, you know, I, I do the slide about fear and passion, but um, there's many types of people. And so you have the fear and passion person but then you also have the, the engineer person who, who just fact, 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 right? So depending upon which audience you're talking to, sometimes in the same room, you might have to change the way your argument is uh, phrased. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I don't have the mic. Uh, so I've worked with a lot of rural energy co-ops trying to convince them to go solar. And I've been told repeatedly that they've got these take or pay agreements or they're even co-owners with large coal-fired power plants. How would fight that, or, or have you battled that yourselves and navigated that? Yeah, I um, I actually live in Durango, Colorado, so I'm a member of Lapato Electric, and um, we're a member of Tri-State, and Tri-State has a 5% cap on the um, generation that the co-op can provide. 
Um, and some co-ops have gotten around that by exiting their contracts. Um, there's Kit Carson Electric in New Mexico. They just bought out of their contract of Tri-State because they want more renewables. Um, so they're gonna be 100% renewable um, during daytime hours um, with some community solar. Um, now as more co-ops exit the distribution, or the uh, G&T, um, that's the price tag is going to keep going up. Um, so I think the way we work with, you know, the way we move forward is to work with Tri-State. They have said that if enough co-ops come to them and ask for a bump in that um, 5%, they'll do it. Um, they just need a critical mass. And they, they are a co-op too. They have to listen to their members. We just have to get, we have to get loud. And so I think there is a path forward through the GNTs. Um, it may be a little bit harder, but I think in the end it would be cheaper for all the co-ops that are still in that um, in that just in that GNT. So one one thought to add to in this area we've got Holy Cross as the rural co-op, and I ran into a, a new member of the board, and there's a, a new president as well. You can be activist. You can get engaged. So one of the things we'd like you to take away with today is, you know, it's kind of a what can I do thing. And one of the things you can do is you can support candidates for the co-op boards. They are elected. And that's, that's a personal action. And Holy Cross has been required to set, I believe, 20% as a renewable standard, and they're up to 43%. I mean, they are a leader. So compare your co-op to what Holy Cross is doing, and you can find a way that you can, can weigh in and participate and be part of the solution. Much of your discussion has been about new build, mm -hmm. the retrofit market. Derek, mm. can you address that? Sure, sure. Um, a lot of times um, uh, we're doing an investment right now, and a lot of investors ask us, and they say, well, I don't understand. Why are you focusing so much on new construction? And that's pretty obvious to me. There's about... Um, three to six billion compatible light sockets that can be converted. The new construction market for lighting alone is 200 billion per year. It's 4.5 trillion new construction market worldwide for just residential and office buildings. That's not roads and streets and things like that. Uh, so the market was significantly bigger. And I also looked at it from a standpoint of stop the bleeding, right? If we keep adding, old, I mean, why would we add old buses to the fleet? We've, we've just heard that the new ones are clearly better. So it's a matter of how quickly can we educate the world? How quickly can we get everybody onto these new technologies and, uh, and just get that efficiency you know, higher and higher, get our consumption down piece by piece? The other, the other response that I would like to make is that the project that we're doing at the Alliance Center right now is a retrofit on a building that is <laughs> a, absolutely a sample of of 94% of, of commercial buildings in the United States. We are retrofitting uh, a 40,000 square foot building to DC uh, on a, a microgrid basis in which we are uh, providing the, the data that will show what the, what the effective energy efficiency gain is in order to, to create a, an economic driver for retrofits. So we're trying to create a roadmap to that retrofit. I could not agree with you more. Derek is absolutely right that, that if we keep feeding in at the top end n new builds that are using the wrong, te uh, using old technology, it's a, it's a losing battle. But if simultaneously we stop the new builds from using old technology and we bring up a percentage of the existing build builds, 40% uh, of the energy in the United States is used in existing commercial buildings. And so it is a huge market for retrofits. Of that, of that uh, percentage, 94% of them are small commercial buildings. These are not the skyscrapers. These are 40 to 50,000 square foot buildings. And that's where the Alliance Center is creating this demonstration, this pilot project, to create the roadmap to do just that. And, and let's talk about the, uh, the roadblocks. This is, I love these kind of panels when we all get lively at each other. <laughs> um, so, so the Alliance is not currently using my technology. 
Well, the reason why is because Sandy is a scientist. <laughs> and actually, and she was adamant. She said, I want to have an AC light and then transition it, change it to DC, and then see the difference between the two. Well, I'm not a conversion product. I have a brand new product that works on its own. You don't have to convert anything. And so the biggest challenge that they were facing was the codes, the building codes. Building codes restrict most progress. Even LED lights themselves, I mean, the, the, the technology was changing so fast that by the time they would get the UL approval done, the LED chips were already outdated. So, you know, even the, the compliance, the, a lot of pressure was put on the compliance groups about this. It's like, we can't wait six months for you to approve a technology and get it out there. So, just, hmm. sorry, but just so you know, the Alliance Center was built in 1908. 19... Oh, okay. So it's <laughs> over hundred years old and it's in an historic district. So we need, we need some more followers because we're, we're nuts. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've got the yeah. nut right here. It, it's yeah. really pretty simple. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Are you doing anything to get technical colleges or community colleges educating the next wave of electricians or whatever so that young people, young kids coming into the field of the, you know, the people who actually installed these things know this and are asking the right questions? Mm. Um, I'll do a quick one and then we'll, maybe we'll turn it over to John for this. So uh, when I was in Mexico two years ago, uh, two days prior, they said, oh, can you speak at the technical college for that very reason? And so I said, oh, no problem. I come down and figure there'd be 20 people. 200 kids were there in a giant auditorium. They loved the presentation. And one of them asked me a great question. They said, why did you do this? Why did you come up with this? I thought about it for a second, and okay, I have three boys, and I want them to have clean air, clean water, things like that, but then I thought about it, I'm like, because I can. <laughs> I mean, all of us just have to kind of look at what we're good at and what we have experience with, and what can we bring to the world, and then just say, okay, this is what I can do, and I'm happy to kind of bring that to the world. So each one of us has to do it. Um, sometimes I think motivating the kids uh, to get involved and to uh, learn about this because they don't have the same paradigms we have, you know, they don't think the same way. That's actually how my career started in energy management systems. I was a kid right out of, well, between my junior and senior year of uh, college, I had an opportunity to work at Merck Pharmaceutical in the plant operations. It's a 50 building plant, right? And I did, I, okay, very strong computer background, a mechanical engineering degree, but I did not know building operation. And they paired me up with these incredibly seasoned guys that knew how, exactly how buildings were supposed to operate. And so they would tell me, oh, if only we could make the sequence do this. And I was the kid that would just go, Ch -ch -ch -ch, no problem, here you go. You know, here was the code for it. So I do think that there's a lot of benefit to be gained from uh, engaging youth into these programs in any way, shape, or possible. Um, and then, of course, the real thing is to help train the technicians because a lot of technologies, unfortunately, falter because they get installed and then they're not maintained. And if they're not maintained correctly, they'll fall into disarray and the energy efficiency is actually worse. Um, Great. Just one, one quick so, add. Uh, the Alliance has worked with colleges mm -hmm. universities over its history. We we're given the 2006 National Leadership Award for Education by an organization from the U.S. Green Building Council. This year we became the first building in the state of Colorado to get platinum certification in existing building operations and management under version, the most current version. So yes, we have the intention of, of continuing to do education, but at the moment we have to establish some data. We are so far out ahead of the curve, we don't have yet the results to be able to teach. So w do we have it in our intention, in our DNA? Are we a showcase in downtown Denver where it's got good access now from, from DIA? Yes. Do we want to continue the education? Yes. <laughs> but we have to be a little bit farther along. Yes, thank you. Um, so to throw in another element to this, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the auto industry. Um, as we talk about building a smart grid, um, you're designing buildings, you have codes to comply with. Uh, there's compatibility issues. How do we yeah, incentivize the auto manufacturers? Because I, the direction I'm going here is electric vehicles. 
um, as you build these buildings, there should be some sort of component that makes it easy for people to charge their vehicles while they're sleeping. And of course, then we need the cybersecurity folks to make sure no one's hacking into our new smart grid. Um, that may be an entirely different discussion, but, but starting just with the auto industry, what, what can be done to bring them in now? Um, because we do have this sort of chicken and egg problem with electric vehicles. People don't buy them because they're afraid they're, they're going to have, um, you know, they're going to run out of juice and there's no place to mm. charge them. Um, and so, of course, the manufacturers, they don't want to build them on spec, hoping that cities are going to start putting in charging stations. So how do you get that particular sector into the conversation? Yeah, well, I think, you, I think you throw up for them the, uh, the uh, infusion, the innovation graph, and you say, OK, into this, into this chasm, how do you folks see this happening in terms of, of, of building, building through the infrastructure in order to make that happen? Uh, I don't know that we're renaissance enough to be able to speak to the, to the transportation. I think the group ahead of us is way, way skilled in, in that particular arena. But what, what is wonderful at this point is the convergence of how all of this is coming together in, a, in one of those serendipitous uh, ways in which technology over here affects transportation. Transportation creates batteries which allows direct current in buildings to be utilized in a way we have not really been able to solve the interruptibility problem up until now. So that convergence is what's going to accelerate that, that S-curve so that it is going to be extremely vertical rather than reasonably flat. So that the speed of change here, uh, I am going to agree with Ryan Pobble from the earlier group, mm. It's not just buses that are going to change fast. It is the totality of the internet of energy that is going to dr change dramatically in the next five years. Mm. In the next and, five years. And I keep coming back to the utilities, but they have a vested interest in having those EVs um, plugged in during the day because that's when they're having to cur curtail renewable load. So um, I think looking to the utilities to start providing those charging stations to, to start the process um, and then yeah you're absolutely right we need those cars ch charging mm. you know during the day um, and so we need that infrastructure um, and maybe you know that becomes part of how you build a parking garage but I think we really can you um, lean on the utilities to to get that going and I want to thank you all for great questions that came up we, uh, we certainly will be and uh, we hope that you have three additional burning questions you just have to ask, but we, uh, I, I'm gonna get gonged out here in a second, and I want to be able, do you have, a, do you have one question? Quick question. One. Um, in, in China, is there a sweet spot that businesses are looking at as far as the payback period goes? Yeah. And what kind of utility rates are they paying in China, and, and are the utility companies giving businesses their incentives to do retrofit projects? Yeah. And well, can you the, do that in 20 seconds? Yeah, sure. Well, the government <laughs> owns everything, first of all. So <laughs> a lot of decisions are much easier there from that standpoint. Energy cost is about the same here. Um, speed of adoption is incredible. Um, and so the payback, though, that they ask for, you know, they'll want like three months, six months. And so many, that's hard. You know, it's very difficult to do. Um, so I'm trying to answer a lot of your questions at the same time. But basically, they, the way the, the culture and the organization, the government works is a little bit different. Um, they kind of let business do their thing for a while until it becomes a problem. And then they address the problem. And when they address the problem, they address it very quickly. So you know, they'll look at a solution like this. Um, uh, Intelligent Buildings Research is doing this study right now. Once they prove this technology works better, they'll just say, OK, everybody, you're going to do this. So, John, you want to you yeah. summarize for us? We've gone out on a limb. We all have to go out on a limb. Chip threw me a softball last year when we were on a panel, and he said, why are you doing this? And he had a phrase that stuck in my head, which is, the world's on fire, you know? So we need to, we need to have people out in front. We need to have people that take chances, and we need to people support those people who are out in front and taking chances. So if you don't know about the benefits, you may know that solar panels produce DC, and then we traditionally we invert it to AC, and then we convert it back to DC for all our solid state, whether it's computers, whether it's your monitors, whether it's your cell phones. That's a great inefficiency. And it's also a metaphor for our political system. 
You would think they would embrace something that would be highly efficient. <laughs> we have opportunities with DC that have been sitting there for, for decades. We've got a system that's in place that's centralized, and we heard about the security panel, that it makes us, in fact, more vulnerable. We can decentralize. It's something each of us can do in our own home. You can do that by changing out the, the LED bulbs you have. But you can also get informed, get familiar. Look at the opportunity to put solar panels on. Look at the opportunity to install batteries in your home and understand the technology. The wiring is low voltage. It's not going to kill you. It's easy to install. There's a lot of opportunity. So we just ask you, help us make this something that becomes commonplace and standard. And it's not going to happen unless all of you get educated, informed, and become activists. So please join us. Become nuts. Thank you. <laughs>